will ask you to unmute. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And uh, you may get started. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear us properly? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, I'll give an introduction very briefly. Uh, your talk is entitled uh, Magnetic Levitation by Rotation and will actually uh, be given by the two of you. So this looks very exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Joachim, and this is Falek, and uh, we want to talk about um, a recent work on this newly discovered uh, type of magnetic levitation. And uh, our work, uh, we've already gotten it accepted in physical review applied, and we expect uh, the paper to come out within the next few days. So, uh, first of all, uh, the phenomena is quite simple to create. All you need is two magnets, one uh, that you spin very rapidly, and once you approach uh, that uh, rotating magnet near a free magnet, you will uh, see that they will, uh, the free magnet locks on to a specific uh, point and will levitate as you move it around. We've then uh, investigated this uh, more thoroughly with a, a, a setup with a better quality control uh, and better speed control. And here we, we see that the uh, rotor magnet is uh, attached uh, to the uh, motor with uh, the north and south uh, perpendicular to the uh, rotation axis. And when you then uh, place a floater magnet or a free magnet underneath, it will uh, find its equilibrium quite quickly. Here in the video, you also see this aluminum plate we have underneath. And this is to uh, uh, create eddy current damping in the uh, uh, free magnet that uh, causes the oscillations to uh, stabilize and thereby uh, making the initial conditions more consistent. Um, using these experiments, here we have painted the north poles of both the rotor and the uh, uh, floater magnet. We see that the uh, uh, floater magnet orientates almost vertically, processing and uh, synchronized with uh, the rotor magnet. We've then also uh, done some uh, simulations. For this one, we started from rest, and here it finds its equilibrium point uh, quite quickly and processes in the same way that uh, our uh, experiment show. Now to the modeling. Yes, so for the next part of the talk, we will try to explain why this phenomenon occurs, why this um levitating state and this exotic moment configuration is stable. So in our model, we have a dipole magnetic field from the rotor acting on the floater. We have drag, which we model as proportional to the linear and angular velocity. And then we have gravity. And because the dipole field decreases with distance, it has gradient, so it produces both a force and a torque that tries to align the floater moment with the dipole field putting these into Newton's second, equation, second law for um, translation and rotation, we get these equations that we can time step integrate to get the full time evolution, as you saw in the last video. And it turns out that it is extremely important that the rotor magnet is somewhat shifted relative to its rotation axis or has its moment tilted, because then besides a rotating horizontal field, there is a vertical static component of the dipole field at the floater. And only then do we get this um, counterintuitive configuration with the moments north, north, and the floater uh, almost vertical with some angle theta. Now I will go through the torque and force balance in st state. So it seems at first that this dipole torque is unbalanced, so the moment should flip over but it is in fact counteracted by the rotation itself. In our simulations, we get this state of rotation where the floater moment processes at the same frequency that the rotor is rotating, omega r, but it has a second rotational mode around the moment itself. This is analogous to a spinning top where you also have spinning around one axis and precession of that rotation axis around vertical. And just like the spinning top can stay upright against gravity, the rotation allows the floater to resist this magnetostatic torque. 
In fact, when we analyze the system in the rest frame of the rotor, then the, the magnetic field and the dipole torque are constant, but we get this fictional gyroscopic torque from the rotation and inertia of the floater. So that's the um, explains the um, orientation of the moments. To explain the levitation itself, we need an attractive force and a repulsive force. The attraction comes from the vertical components of the dipole field and the floater moment, while the repulsion comes from the horizontal component because the horizontal components are anti-parallel and so lead to repulsion instead of attraction. There also is the effect of gravity, but this is a small and unnecessary correction. The phenomenon is fundamentally magnetic. Okay, now why does this happen some, from rest and why is it stable? Well, because of this balance between the gyroscopic torque and the magnetostatic torque, the steady state orientation of the floater will be a function of distance. It will be more horizontal when the magnets are close to each other and more vertical when they are far away. And this means that the repulsive and the attractive force scale differently with distance. It is more repulsive at short range and more and relatively more attractive at long range. And in between is an equilibrium point. And also at displacement in either direction leads to a restoring force, which is why it is stable. Indeed, when we do simulations with the center of the floater fixed in space, so we just look at the rotation, we can get force curves like this, uh, the average force and steady state versus distance. And in some cases, it crosses from positive, so attractive, to repulsive, so negative, so repulsive, uh, as the distance decreases, which corresponds to a stable equilibrium point. This explanation does not require gravity at all, which is why the phenomenon works in all directions. And when we reach steady state in the simulations, then turn off damping, it remains stable. Damping makes it easier to reach from rest, but it is not strictly required. All we need is the magnetic interaction and gyroscopic stability from the rotation and inertia of the float. So uh, up to now, we've only looked at a neodymium iron bore uh, magnets and uh, of one particular size in magnetization. So we've conducted experiments uh, where we vary the magnetization uh, uh, while keeping the size constant. And we've also uh, done vice versa, uh, changing the uh, size of the magnet, uh, keeping the magnetization constant. And here in this graph, we see the minimum uh, speed uh, of which the rotor has to rotate uh, to uh, for levitation to occur. And here we can see as the magnets become larger, they have more inertia and thereby can levitate at lower speeds than the result uh, than the smaller magnets, where magnetization doesn't really affect uh, the uh, minimum speed required for levitation. On the other hand, if you look at what uh, distance away uh, uh, the levitation happens. Uh, when you have a larger magnet, they tend to levitate uh, closer to each other, where uh, a stronger magnetic uh, uh, or a remnant uh, would cause the magnets to levitate further away. Um, now, to compare theory and experiment, we needed to uh, do simulations with many parameter values, but only some of these lead to stable levitation. So we fixed the, or the position of the floater just looking at the rotational dynamics, and then we get this uh, plot of dynamical phases. At low frequencies and small distances, the moments are anti-parallel in steady state, as we expect in the static case just from the magnetostatic energy. In the blue phase, we get the configuration that we observe experimentally when they levitate with the north-north alignment and the floats are pointing nearly vertical. Um, in between, in the green phase, the motion is more complicated with the theta angle, the floater polar angle varying in time. Um, but only in the blue phase do we get these force curves that change sign for distance. Um, some of these uh, force curves are consistently negative, which means that the attractive force never exceeds gravity. 
In other cases, they only cross um, the x-axis once, which means that the uh, magnets collide before they reach the equilibrium point. But there are some um, re experimentally relevant parameter values where it crosses from positive to negative with decreasing distance. They are marked by orange crosses, and these are the predicted um, equilibrium points. We can compare this to our experimental data. So we have the same x and y axis, rotor speed versus levitation distance, and we see the same general trend. Increasing the rotor speed decreases the equilibrium distance. Um, but the experimental data is in a somewhat broader frequency band and slightly lower frequencies, which suggests that there's still room for quantitative improvement in the parameter determination and the um, theoretical model itself. And now on to something that the model also cannot uh, really predict. Uh, and this is the different uh, modes that the uh, oscillate, uh, that the phenomena can have. And so let's say we keep this uh, magnet uh, constant uh, with the same uh, size, and we just change the rotor speed. What happens is then at low speeds, uh, no modes will occur and it will just uh, float. But then once you hit a resonance at uh, a bit higher speeds, you start to see this up-down mode appearing. Um, and then at even higher, you will start to see this side mode, which we've also seen uh, in simulations. Um, and then at even higher uh, frequencies, we see this mixed mode uh, between this up-down mode and side mode. And then at uh, even higher frequencies, uh, the uh, floater magnet has moved uh, close enough to the rotor magnet that the uh, magnetic field changes quite uh, uh, dramatically during its oscillations, leading to a U-shaped mode. So in conclusion, the phenomena is easy to create. All you need is a spinning a tool and uh, two magnets, and uh, it doesn't uh, require gravity, meaning that you can move the magnets in any orientation and a context lastly in 3D. Just to sum up the uh, theory, there's a, a rotation a counter the magnetostatic torque is counteracted by the rotation torque from the, the gyroscopic precession. And for further improvements, uh, we need uh, eddy currents and instabilities to uh, maybe uh, get these up-down modes uh, uh, in our simulations. And we would like some more uh, quantitative theory for uh, uh, predicting the curves and the parameter dependence. Thank you. And it's time for questions. Wow, this is really, really very cool. Um, thanks so much for showing us this. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question. Um, if we, uh, anybody would like to raise their hand. Um, uh, otherwise, maybe I can ask one quick question. Uh, question. Um, how on earth did you figure this out? Uh, well, what, what inspired you to start spinning a magnet uh, on top of another magnet like you show in the uh, clip here? I mean, it, so this is so really our neat. paper is not the first one in the field. Uh, it's actually the second one. The first paper uh, was written by someone who discovered it in their backyard as an aerospace engineer. And uh, magically, we stumbled upon this paper, uh, and uh, uh, and then we tried reproducing it ourselves and got shocked when we saw it actually worked. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Mm. Yes. Uh, yes, they want to go test it out in the lab now. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I look forward to going and reading this paper. Um, we will now move to our next uh, speaker.